Amen. 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 Um, if you, um, oh, I'm going to grab that. Um, if you have your Bibles, go to Ephesians 1. Go to Ephesians chapter 1. It's in the New Testament. <clears throat> Acts, Romans, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. I grew up Baptist. They made, a mem- made us memorize them all. Sword drills. Who grew up doing a sword drill? Anybody? Come on, somebody. Yep. Okay, so Ephesians. Let me give you just a little bit of background before we read the verse verse. So we're going to do the book of Ephesians at six chapters. We're going to do all of them in six weeks. We're going to take one chapter per week. And the way that we do this is we're going to draw the focus in a certain number of verses that we really want to teach around. And then you're kind of on your own throughout the rest of the week to read the rest of the chapter and see the full message that Paul's got for us. So Ephesians was written by the Apostle Paul. Now in our Acts series, one of the things that you've seen there is we've been following the career of the Apostle Paul. He used to be Saul, if you remember him. Jesus got a hold of this violent man who had persecuted the church and and, and rode to Damascus. And Jesus got a hold of him and he became a missionary. He became a church planter. And in the book of Acts, it's actually Acts chapter 19, one of the cities that he goes to is a city called Ephesus. And so what you've got in the book of Acts is kind of like a history book or a narrative or a novel, if you want to look at it that way. But then in the, rest of the, in the rest of the New Testament, you've got what are called epistles or letters. So this is the correspondence. These are the letters that the apostles wrote to the individual churches to either rebuke them or strengthen them, encourage them, whatever it might have been. And in Ephesians, Paul writes this letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, Paul had been there for three years. And it's five years after he left Ephesus that he's writing this letter to them. Ephesus is a major city. There's a a historian at that time called Ephesus, the first and greatest metropolis of Asia. It was a a trade hub. It It was a port city. It was massively important, but it was also a massive melting pot in ancient days. So not only did you have Jews and Gentiles, but you had people from all over the world. All would convene there at Ephesus and they lived there. It was, a, it was a cultural, societal melting pot. Now, why is that important? Because Lawton is a melting pot. Yes, because of Fort Sill. We get people from all over the country, all over the world, come to Fort Sill. And you really never know who you're going to talk to, do you? Um, and, and God does so much through that melting pot of culture here. And so there's going to be some things in Ephesus that are going to relate to us and are going to matter to us as we go through it. Eventually, after Paul had left, he got arrested and he was in, under house arrest in prison in Rome. And while in Rome, he wrote four letters. One of them was Ephesians to Ephesus. They're called the four prison epistles. So that's your background on Ephesians. Now, let me tell you how Ephesians can impact you. And I'm going to do it through the story of a gentleman named John McKay. John McKay grew up in Scotland. And um, there's a story he tells where when he was 14 years old, so he's not at church. He's not a Christian yet. He grew up in church, but not a Christian. Some of you know what I mean by that. Um, He took his Bible and he walked out into the Scottish hills and just opened it up and went to Ephesians chapter one and just began reading. And this is what he says. He says that while he was walking along the Scottish hills, Ephesians grabbed hold of him and he experienced a boyish rapture. And as a result, he made right there a passionate protestation to Jesus Christ among the rocks in the starlight. Here's some more quote from him. He says, I saw a new world. Everything was new. I had a new outlook, new experiences, new attitudes to other people. I loved God. Jesus Christ became the center of everything to me. I had been quickened. I was really alive. Now, the story of John McKay is that he became a missionary to Peru for several years. And he had a whole lot of things that happened in his career. He eventually ended up as the president, the third president of Princeton Theological Seminary. That's John McKay. And he wrote commentary on the book of Ephesians, came back to this book many years later. And he says, to this book, I owe my life. 
It is truth that sings, doctrine set to music. You know, like doctrine set to music, that sounds like a professor, doesn't it? <clears throat> we have a hard time relating to that. But truth that sings, that struck me. Because sometimes it's easy to just read the Bible or just go to Sunday school and just hear the truth and it just kind of washes over you. But it's a different thing for it to sing. Sometimes even our worship songs, sometimes we just kind of autopilot through them, don't we? I do. <laughs> I'm glad you don't. <laughs> but sometimes we do. But that day in the Scottish Hills, it sang to him. And here's what strikes me about it. Whether it sings to you is a work of the Holy Spirit. It's a miracle. I hope it sings to you today. And that's going to be the question as we go through. Is, is the truth of all that God has done for you singing into your heart? Ephesians 1, chapter 1, verse 1, says this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to God's holy people in Ephesus who are faithful followers of Christ Jesus. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. So that's his intro. That's, that's the beginning of his letter. And he says something there that's very, very important for us. He says that he is writing to the believers who are in Ephesus. He is not penning a letter to the whole world regardless of their religious affiliation, regardless of whether or not Jesus Christ has become their savior, their Lord, their king. He's writing specifically to the actual Greek words here is the saints in Ephesus. Did you know that you are a saint if you are in Christ Jesus today? You're like, well, I haven't lived a perfect life and I haven't done any miracles personally. That's just church tradition stuff. The actual meaning of the word in the New Testament is if you are in Christ, you are a saint. Amen. And so he addresses this to the saints in Ephesus. Also, I'll tell you, we're about to read verse three. Verse three through 14. And yeah, you heard me right. I said 14. It's one long sentence. One. With no punctuation in it. How many ever got voted down by your teacher for run-on sentences? <laughs> Paul doesn't care. Um, this is classic Apostle Paul stuff. So he'll start writing and he'll get going and he'll just go. Um, and, and this is what you get. So what you're going to read from verse 13 or first, first three, sorry, all the way down through verse 14 is one, some scholars think it's a poem. Scum, some scholars think he's, he's writing a, a, a song himself creatively. He's just, he's going on in worship about all that God has done for us. And you're just going to hear the worshipful tone as we go through it. But he's not even taking a breath, just so you know. Verse three, all praise to God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. What a statement. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. You're like, well, my car doesn't run. <laughs> I get it. I wish there was more money in my paycheck. I get it. There's all the physical blessings. There's all the temporal blessings. There's all the, the things in this life practically that we pray and we ask God to move in. Sometimes we forget about the spiritual blessings that he's given us and how massive they are. Can I just, I'll, I'll give you a few. Do you know God has given you a brand new heart from the ground up? Yep. Amen. He replaced your heart of stone that you used to have. And the Bible says he gave you a heart of flesh. He softened your heart. He's also given you a new spiritual family, the church, yes. who will always love you and accept you. And you will always be in that family. Back again, we're going to plug those life groups. That's why you should get in a life group today. Because sometimes we're part of a church family, but we're not enjoying the blessings of a church family. So get in one. The next thing God has given you is a, a clean slate and perfect forgiveness in him where he doesn't just forgive your sins, he forgets them. And he has cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. That's his poetic language to tell you. He has completely forgotten what you have done. Amazing. God has given you a brand new identity. God does not see you in your identity, the, the real essence of who you are. He does not see it as the sins that you have committed. He does not see you as your past. 
He does not see you as your shame. He sees you as one with Jesus Christ himself. And the righteousness that Jesus accomplished, God takes to your account. Pastor Jonathan at the Linger Conference two weeks ago said, it's like God the Father looks at us through rose-colored glasses. And that's true. You have the approval of God over your life. You have a divine purpose. You have a, a goal. You have a plan for your life. Always. You have a reason to live. What is it? Well, it's to love God and to know God and to make God known to others. Why are you still on this planet? Because other people need to find Jesus and they need to hear your testimony. That includes your kids, by the way. You need to live Jesus, live the life of Jesus in front of other people because as you do, they will be drawn to Jesus Christ. It's part of your job in this world. You have a great purpose. You also have truth. You have the only source of wisdom and truth in the whole world. Did you know that's been given to you? The Bible? This world is full of lies. But there is one place that has the truth and it's in God's word. That's been given to you. Also, the Holy Spirit has been given to you. That's right. Right. And with the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about this later on, is God's guarantee of salvation. It is his joy. It is his peace. It is the sonship or daughtership that you experience. The gifts that he gives you through the Holy Spirit. And then the very ears of the Almighty are always attuned to your prayers. If you would ever stop and decide to speak to the king of the universe, he listens. Right. He's immediately attentive to you. You have, in royal terms, you have audience with the king whenever you want it. That's amazing access that has been purchased for us through Jesus. Also, you have real peace now, real actual peace anxiety and fear. You've got a source of peace. Even in an election year, you could have peace. Why? Because there's only one king that actually matters. Amen. And he is on his throne and he is in control and no one will take him off the throne and he deserves to be on his yeah. throne and his judgments are true and right and good. Yeah. Yeah. And then we have destiny in heaven. Just take this in. All the blessings of God. You have destiny in heaven. It is secure if you were in Jesus Christ. It will be beauty like you've never known. It will be healing like you've never known. You will be reunited with family. You will be face to face with Jesus. And you don't have to fear death like the rest of the world fears death. Hallelujah. Every spiritual blessing is already yours. Do you see what Paul's saying? There's a lot to say. Next, verse four. Even before God made the world, he loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. And God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what God wanted to do. It gave him great pleasure to do it. And so we praise God for his glorious grace that he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and he forgave our sins. Paul's just going off. It's awesome. No punctuation. He's not even done. It's maybe halfway through at best, right? So let's take that section because I need to explain some of the big things that he's trying to convey there. There's three big things I want to walk us through. First one is even before he made the world, yes, yes. God chose you, God loved you, and he adopted you before Walmart even existed. <laughs> before Alexander the Great, before he created the trees, he saw you. Yes, he did. Before he set fire to the sun, he saw you. He saw you from eternity past into the future and loved you and chose you and adopted you. It's mind-blowing that God signed our adoption papers before he said, let there be light. Yeah? Yeah. Why does that matter? It matters because he was thinking of us. 
It matters because you've been loved for millennia. You just didn't even know it. It matters because you've been planned on. Your rescue out of your sin to Christ, it's been a master plan that's been in the works for millennia. Then he says he's adopted us into his own family. I knew, uh, or I know, a close friend of mine, his name's Chad. We've been friends for a long time. And uh, Chad's a little bit older than me, and he's an elder at a church I used to be a pastor at, and great guy. And I heard him give a talk once, and he made the whole talk about the fact that he was adopted. And his parents had adopted him. He, he had met his birth family later on, but he loved his adopted parents. And he would talk about that. And he saw this particular scripture. It was massive for him because he's, he's like, adoption means something, right? Like, like my kids will say things like, I get it, dad, you have to love me. You're supposed to say that. You're my dad. What they're trying to say is, you're obligated to love me. We share DNA, right? Yep. Like that's, that's what they're trying to get. Adoption's different. Adoption doesn't have to. Adoption gets to. Yes. Amen. People make a decision. They, they see you. They get to know you. And then they decide whether or not to choose you. And once they've chosen you, it was their choice and their pleasure to love you. Yes. That's the difference with adoption. And so God comes into this whole thing and says, I saw you from the beginning of the world. And I adopted you way back there because I saw you. I knew you more deeply than anyone else has ever known you before. And I wanted you. Whew. Man, that matters to me. And then Paul says it gave God great pleasure which is just his way of saying God loves you and he likes you, like we talked about in the last series. Jesus had said, I, we read this several times to you, uh, don't be afraid, little flock, for it gives the Father great pleasure to give you the kingdom. God liked you first, chose you. Uh, get personal real quick. Many of you have been rejected by people. It's a big part of your story. You weren't chosen in a human sphere. You weren't chosen. And that, that not being chosen has created a wound in you. It's a big part of what has made you who you are. It's a big part of what will decide how you move forward in the future. God has come to say, especially to those of us who have been rejected by humans, that God himself chose you. That's important. That's an important truth to not just know once. That's an important truth to get into your soul and to meditate on and to let it change you, to let it sing to you. We need to know it. Truth that sings. The third thing, he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. What a phrase. He purchased our freedom with the blood of his son. Um, some of your translations there say that he redeemed us. He redeemed us with the blood of Christ. Redeem is a, a special word. It means that you were in a certain kind of bondage. You were, you were enslaved. You were in jail. You were in prison. You were in something and you couldn't get out on your own. That's the word picture there. And the only way to get you out was to buy you out, like with a ransom. You had to be bought out of your state so that you could be set free. That's the picture is that you were bought back. You were redeemed. You were ransomed by the blood of Jesus Christ so that you could be set free. So why are we, why are we enslaved? Yes. Because all have sinned. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Amen. I don't have it on your screen for you. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the thing is, I don't have to list your sins for you because you already know. You already know what you've done. Which of the Ten Commandments have you not broken? <laughs> I'm not trying to be mean. 
just trying to be real and direct and clear. We've broken them, guys. You know, even if you thought, well, there's a couple on the list I don't think I broke. Well, Jesus settled that for you in the uh, Sermon on the Mount. He came along and said, you know, anyway, I won't get into that. <laughs> Some things that we haven't done in the physical realm, and we've certainly done it in our hearts. There's a, there's a modern singer, and he's got this line. He says, I'm still angry at my parents for what their parents did to them. I'll give you one more shot at that. I'm still angry at my parents for what their parents did to them. Isn't that real? You get to a certain point in your own therapy that you start to realize what grandma and grandpa did to mom and dad and what mom and dad then did to you. And you start seeing the generational sin that moves from group to group to group to group. And it's massive. And all of a sudden you start to see these are some of the reasons why I find myself doing some of these things almost like a compulsion that I don't even want to do. And why do I see the world the way that I see it? It's because of other people's sin that has impacted me and set the course for my life. And without meaning to, I'm setting the course for my own kids' life. And it's just not my kids. It's my spouse and it's my friends and it's my coworkers. It's everybody around me. And that's the part that if I really have courage, maybe I can face is that I'm not just mad at my grandparents for what they did to my parents. I'm going to have to start being mad at myself for what I'm doing to the next generation. Because I'm part of the chain. And the more I start to realize what has really set me here emotionally and mentally and spiritually, I start to see the things that I'm doing in the now that are impacting others. Is it possible that we are planting seeds of sin, brothers and sisters, that will have impact for generations to come? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin, it's the consequences of sin. That's all it's trying to say. It's trying to say that when you're breaking the Ten Commandments, it's massive. And we don't like to face that. We don't, we don't like to face the, the real impact that we're making, but the Bible says it's true. And the closer we can, or the sooner that we can get our head wrapped around that idea, we'll start to realize why Jesus had to die. We'll start to realize why he had to volunteer himself to be tortured because someone had to pay the consequences because we weren't very good at paying the consequences ourselves. And those consequences, not only were they going down through the generations, but guys, they were binding us up. They were separating us from God and they were bringing divorces into our marriages and and separating friends and, and, and bringing all kinds of destruction into our world. But also what about addiction for a second? Like it's, it's one thing to look at other people's addictions and that's fun, right? Like let's look at other people's addictions because they got into the wrong drug, got into the wrong thing and now they can't say no anymore. And why is it? What is it, what is it about that particular substance where that once you start, it's no longer just a thrill, it's an obligation. It's something that you have to do now. You're enslaved to it. Why is that true? And the more you start to go down that road, the more you realize that, We've all kind of picked our poison, actually. It's not just them. Because when it comes to pornography and it comes to anger and it comes to our people pleasing, it comes to our greed and it comes to our money and it comes to all these different things, they all have an addictive component, don't they? Yes, they do. Aren't you always finding yourself, because I am, aren't you always finding yourself doing things that you don't want to do? Aren't you always finding yourself somehow tied to this thing and you can't get free no matter how much you've wanted to get free? Do you see what he's saying there? Saying sin has consequences and you are bound up and you've got to be set free. And so Jesus voluntarily walked into torture and death. So the verse that we had up there does not say by the kindness of God, you've been set free and redeemed. It says by the blood of Jesus, you've been set free and redeemed. Why? Because he had to bleed. He had to suffer. His body was broken. That's why we take the juice and we take the bread because we, 
we remember the way he bled. We remember the way his body was broken. And that might sound gruesome to you, but we're just going back to the central act of love in the history of the universe. Amen. We have to. Next. I'll pause here real quick. There's a lot of theological truth in this passage. And as I read down through it, kind of first brush, it, it felt a little Sunday school-y to me. It felt like things that a lot of us kind of know. And I started to pray and I started to ask God, God, who's this for? Who's Ephesians chapter one for? Is this just Paul like singing? Is it just him writing a poem? Is it just supposed to be beautiful and fun? Like, who's this for? And God spoke to me right away on this. Um, said this particular passage is for a person. It's for somebody, a very specific person. And you're here today. And you're online today. And it's for the broken and the tired and the hopeless. That's who it's for. This passage that Paul's talking about, it is for those with weary exhausted souls. There's a verse in Jonah that says, when my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord. Ever have your soul faint within you? Ever come to the end of yourself? Come to the end of the road of your own strength and your own ability to fix your own life and just finally give up and finally surrender? Some of you walked in this morning and that's right where you're at. You don't have to raise your hand. I'm not going to put you on the spot like that, but like exhaustion. I've tried to fix it and I've tried everything. And if you're in that place, this song today is, it's for you. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorites. Um, I always try to work a little C.S. Lewis into the message, always. So he grew up in the church when he was, I think, 15 years, 15 years old. He um, uh, rejected Christ and became an atheist and didn't believe God at all. And, and he was so brainy and, and smart that he became an Oxford professor, Lewis did. And um, while he was at Oxford, he was 32 years old. So quite a while he had been an atheist. God had just been working on him. And God just... Used other people. If you know Lord of the Rings, J.R.R. Tolkien was one of those people that he used in a friendship with Lewis to challenge him and speak to him about Christ. Finally, he kind of gave up. And this is the way he describes it, his conversion at the age of 32. He says, you must picture me alone in that room in Magdalen, night after night, feeling the steady, unrelenting approach of God, whom I so earnestly desired not to meet. That which I greatly feared had at last come upon me. In 1929, I gave in and admitted that God was God, and I knelt and I prayed, perhaps that night the most sad and reluctant convert in all of England. Kicking, struggling, resentful, and darting his eyes in every direction for a chance to escape. See, those aren't the stories that we hear a lot. You think about someone... Uh, surrendering to Jesus Christ and getting saved. And you think the angels are singing and, 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 and heaven opens and, and the music is swelling. And a lot of times it's not that. A lot of times it, I'm at the end of myself and I have no choice but to surrender. Lewis was at a spot where he had no choice but to surrender because he had tried everything else and his surrender was a complicated surrender like a lot of ours will be. So these promises today, if you're in that place of soul-fainting desperation, they are a love letter to you. They are truth that sings, and I hope that you hear them. Ephesians 1.8. He has showered, God has showered his kindness on us along with all wisdom and understanding. God has now revealed to us his mysterious will regarding Christ, which is to fulfill his own good plan. God's got a plan. Verse 10, and this is the plan. 
at the right time, he will bring everything together under the authority of Christ. Everything in heaven and on earth. Every single human leader and every single spiritual leader will all be brought under Jesus Christ. And then we'll finally have peace. Furthermore, because we are united with Christ, we have received an inheritance from God for he chose us in advance and he makes everything work out according to his plan. So the plan is he chose us at the beginning of time and he adopted us. Now I need to take a little theological break. So either nap is your number one option or number two, really turn your brains on for this section. Okay, because you're going to need them because these are going to, this is going to answer a few questions. A little theology break, because as soon as it says that God adopted us at the beginning of time, at the beginning of time, that's when God chose us. It starts to bring some questions up in us and you can't escape those questions. One of the questions is, did God choose me before I chose him? And if that's the case, what does that mean? Also, if God chose me before I chose him, does that mean he unchose? That's not a word. A everybody else? Does that mean he rejected everybody else? Even before they had a chance. It starts to bring us to some troubling stuff. So here's a couple of verses. First is Romans 8, 29. Did God choose some and reject others? Look at what it says. It says, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Now, this is a different spot where Paul kind of pulls back the veil and he helps you understand exactly how this happened. He says, listen, God in eternity past, before the creation of the world, he actually looked ahead because God can do that. He looked ahead in the future and he saw what you would do. He saw whether or not you would surrender to Jesus. And when he foreknew, when he knew you in advance and he knew what you would choose in advance, he chose you. Amen. Does that make sense? I know it's a brain bender. Next, 2 Corinthians 5, 14. Did Jesus only come to save a few? We believe that Jesus Christ died for all. We also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Did you hear all there? Did you hear everyone there? When Jesus came and died, he did not just die for the church. He did not just die for the elect. Jesus came and he died for all, made the salvation plan available to all, came to rescue all. In 2 Peter, it says, the Lord desires, he wills that none should perish. He longs for no one to miss out or to miss him. The salvation plan of God is for everyone. And I know that's a tension. God saw we would choose him. God chose us. Again, it's hard to wrap our brains around, but that's the way that works. Here's an illustration that somebody gave me. It was a little bit helpful for me. Um, it uses a plane, like a 747 uh, plane. And imagine the plane is God's rescue operation for mankind. It is his plan of salvation for mankind. Here's the thing. God built the plane at the beginning of time. The plane is perfect. The plane is unstoppable. And God built the plane because he was not surprised that mankind fell. Jesus Christ was not version 2.0 in the history of God. God looked ahead and he knew exactly what Adam and Eve were going to do in the Garden of Eden. He was not surprised. Amen. God looked ahead and he knew exactly the way that you were going to reject God when you rejected God. God looked ahead and he knew exactly how stubborn you would be. Yeah, he did. And he made all of his plans with that in mind. God knew when you would need him and God made the plan long ago. He looked into the future and saw that you would yield. And so he gave you a seat on that plane. Amen. See, the plane is perfect. The question is, will you be on the plane? That's where your choice to surrender comes in. Because you do have a choice. I kind of, just to stretch the analogy to its breaking point, I kind of imagine angels at the airport, right? Like trying to help people get onto the plane. 
Like you, you don't realize the trouble that you're in. You don't realize the danger that you're in. Like let's, let's go this way and encouraging you and teaching you and correcting you and like slowly trying to like, like let's get there. But you still have a choice. At any point with all that encouragement and all that leading, you can say no. And when I look out across this room, I got to tell you, and it's just being honest, not everybody in this room will choose Christ. Not everybody in this room. Some of you will refuse. Why would anybody refuse? Because if someone walks up to you and says that they forgive you, in some cases, if you don't think you need to be forgiven, that's offensive. Yeah? You have to agree with the judgment before you can agree to the forgiveness. Some of us aren't willing to look at God and agree with him on the judgment of our own behavior in our own life. Some of us are not willing to yield the control of our life. I'm the captain of my ship, thank you very much. No one else gets to come in and tell me what to do. To make God master and Lord and king of my life, that's a massive decision. A lot of people are not going to want to make that decision. It's making sense. A lot of people are offended by God. Have you listened to our culture lately? Many don't agree with God. Many are offended by God and what he says is right and wrong. It is your choice whether or not you will yield to him and God. And this is the most terrifying idea I'm going to share today. God will respect your choice. He protects your choice. He gave you your choice and he will respect the choice that you make whether or not to surrender. So the plane is the unstoppable mission and plan of God to save all mankind. The question is whether or not you will get on the plane. Ephesians 1.12, God's purpose was that we Jews who were the first to trust in Christ would bring praise and glory to God. So salvation first came to the Jewish people is what he's saying. And the Jews in Ephesus, by the way. And then he says, and then now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. Just real quick on this slide. Notice all the choices they're making. So God chose them, but do you see how they're choosing him? These are their actions. The Jews trusted in Christ, not in themselves. The Gentiles came along. They decided to hear the truth and then they decided to believe in Christ for their salvation. These are their choices. This is their partnering with God, surrendering to him. And then at the end it says, and then he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, the way the Bible puts it, when you surrender to Jesus and that supernatural spiritual moment really happens, it says you become a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And when the new comes, part of that process of changing you is the Holy Spirit comes to reside in your soul. The Holy Spirit is also with you. Third member of the Trinity, God himself. He is always with you. He is always in you. That's why the New Testament calls you the temple of the Holy Spirit as a person. Do you know you're a temple? Do you know this building is not holy, but you are? Oh, let that break your brain for a minute. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is inside of you. And so the way he talks about it here is he says, he comes and puts the Holy Spirit in you as a seal. It's like a brand seal saying, this is an actual Christian right here. And how do you know that that's happened? Well, there's several ways that the Holy Spirit shows himself as he comes into your life if you've had this experience before. One of the ways is the scripture says, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. So all of a sudden, you might not have been this way before, but suddenly you're this way where you know what the commands of God are and you care. You suddenly begin caring that the things that are going on in your life are not what Jesus wants you to do. You might have even known the Bible before in your own life. You just didn't care that you were offending God. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, you have to care. 
He makes you care. That's one of the evidences of the change has happened. The Holy Spirit comes in and he brings his joy. He brings his peace. He brings his gifts. The scripture even says, it's the Holy Spirit that, sa- that cries out inside of you, Abba, Father, to God. Hallelujah. You don't feel like God is far away. You feel like God is near. You even use words like Abba, which was just the Greek for saying Papa or Dad to him. You use personal words with God because you feel your sonship with him. You know you're in the family or your daughtership with him. You know you're in his family. All that is the work of the Holy Spirit, and that is the seal Now here's where it gets really fun. Next verse. Last verse we're going to do today. The spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance that he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. This is powerful. The Holy Spirit inside of you becomes God's guarantee that you will be rescued is the guarantee that no matter how you begin the Christian life, if you are truly in Christ, you will get there, no matter what. People struggle with fear all the time as they become a Christian that maybe I'll sin too much and suddenly I'll lose God's favor. Suddenly I'll lose my relationship with him. Nope. If you've got the Holy Spirit... You have the guarantee of God on your salvation. The word there for guarantee in the Greek, it's called arhabon. I'm going to make you say it. Arhabon. Again, arhabon. Arhabon. Arhabon means uh, earnest money or a down payment. Arhabon is like a security deposit that you make on a thing. It's a financial term. It's only used three times in the whole New Testament. It's used all three times by Paul. It's used here once, and then it's used twice in the book of 2 Corinthians. And the usages there are the same exact way. He says, when the Holy Spirit comes into the life of an individual uh, believer, it is our habon. It is the guarantee that they will be saved, and the guarantee can't be taken away. Some of you guys signed up for an apartment once and they made you give a security deposit. Same idea. And what are you saying with the security deposit? I'm gonna give you this money and then if I trash your apartment or do something wrong, you get to keep the earnest money at the end, the security deposit at the end, right? Because I blew the arrangement. So what God is saying is, You've got the Holy Spirit in you. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. He can't send you to hell. Can't. It's not just doesn't want to anymore. He can't. Not at this point. Because the Holy Spirit is inside of you as a guarantee. If God sends you to hell, he sends himself to hell. Hmm. If you have surrendered to Jesus Christ today, you are absolutely secure in him. You do not have to fear. It is not his will that you would fear about your future. He wants instead for you to feel secure in him and to know what he's given you today so that you go forward in gratitude and in worship. (laughs) That's the thing that changes you. Not this constant It has been guaranteed for you. That's how good God is. Would you stand? We're going to pray. Okay. Here's how we're going to do this. Sometimes God leads us into a place in our messages where we share the gospel of Jesus Christ very, very clearly And when we do, I always want to give you an opportunity to surrender to Jesus before you leave those doors. And I want to walk you through that. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's an actual being saved. 
there's an actual line that you can cross and you weren't saved on one side and you're saved on the other side because you surrendered. You got on the plane. You said, yes, Jesus, come in. I want you in my life. So I want to give you that opportunity today. One of the things that we do is we have Bibles at the back of the church. If you make a decision to follow Jesus today with your life, what I want you to do is after the service is completely over, go back to the sound booth and say, I need my Bible. It's free. It's a study Bible. They're actually a little bit expensive, but we want to help you to start your walk with Jesus Christ. It's not just the scriptures, it's study notes down below so that you can find out what some of these words actually mean as you're going along. Have your own journey, have your own adventure with Jesus, amen? We want that for you. When I started this morning, I counted them back there. We had 24 left. I pray they're all gone by the end of the day. Make us order more. I would love it. But go back and get a Bible. In just a second, we're going to bow our heads, close our eyes. But I just tell you, this, this may be the very first time that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. It may be that in your past, maybe you have already given your heart to Jesus Christ. But there's been confusion. Some of these things didn't make sense for you. And so you're going to rededicate yourself today. That's also incredible. So why don't you bow your heads and close your eyes. We're going to pray this prayer together a phrase at a time, not because the words are magic, because they're not. The Lord sees through to your heart. He just wants these to be your words meant by your own heart, your way. But if you're praying this along with me, could I ask you to raise your hand? Because I want to give you a step of boldness to take. Just to say, Pastor, I'm praying this with you right now. Everybody's eyes are closed. Yeah, I'm with you right now. I'm in this prayer with you. Praise God for that. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for choosing me. Thank you for adopting me. Thank you for loving me at the beginning of time. Jesus, thank you for shedding your blood. I now surrender myself. You are my Savior. You are my Lord and King. I give my life to you. Please change me. Bring me into your kingdom. I want all these blessings. Fill me with your spirit. Give me your guarantee. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Amen.